It is October 26, 2013, and uh, it is the Sabbath here in the middle of Sukkot, or Tabernacles. But just welcome everyone, everyone who's been here before and everyone who hasn't. We just have a prayer. Sure. So we're gonna have we're gonna have prayer. I just want to just briefly explain for those who haven't been here really so far. And we'll explain this a lot more uh this morning as we go into this. This morning we're gonna summarize what we've been going through through the week. And so um in this you'll notice that we're praying as we've seen this in the verse that we have on the screen, Ephesians three, our family in heaven and earth. So we pray, we've been praying to our family in heaven. And um, I just want to mention uh, Ellen White in her first vision talks about Jesus having a new name. And we've come to understand in our study this week that Jesus' name is the branch. So when we, if we pray in the name of the branch, just understand we're talking about Jesus Christ. So just wanted to mention this so that you guys are familiar with it. So let's uh, pray and then we'll uh, begin. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so very much that we can be here, come together, and open up the scripture to understand the inspired message that we can do. It has been such a marvelous weekend. And I just want to thank you so much for orchestrating things. For us to get together this song. Thank you so much for being uh providing Tim and Helen with this home that they can share with us here and that can be used all for your glory. This is such a wonderful gift. And thank you so much for sending your spirit, dear brother. We thank you for sending your spirit to be here with us. And so we ask for your guidance. For this day and praise you as um as giving us this wonderful day of the Sabbath, not only to just take a break from our, our weekly routine, but also to contemplate and to experience your creative power. So thank you so so much. Thank you for events and thank you for justification that we We thank you so much for all these things and everything that we ask. We ask in the name of two hundred and sixty. Amen. Okay, so today, again, like I said, we're going to just be, it's going to be a big summary of everything we've gone through so far, and uh, we've gone through a whole lot of information, so we're not going to be able to go over any one particular aspect in much detail. Uh, because we've done that for the week, and as we saw, it took some time, right, to go through everything. Um, it took a week. You know, it took a week. We had two meetings a day, except for Thursday night, and each meeting probably lasted almost two hours, some of them more than two hours. On average, we probably did two hours each meeting. So an average of four hours a day uh, this week uh, since last Sabbath. Our overall theme that we've had has been, as you see up here in our banner, that people shall be willing in the day of that power. And we found that that's in context of justification by faith. So justification by faith, as been our study, we found out that justification by faith is the gospel. And so we've been studying it um, in many, from many different angles, and uh, it's all been pointing to the same thing, justification by faith and the love of a family. And so we're going to be discussing that a little bit more. Um, but what I was thinking we're going to do is just go through a little bit on each particular subject. And uh, I'll just mention, as we began this week, I I knew perhaps what the first one study would be. And I figured that out the morning before. <laughs> Every day I kind of knew what we should do, but I haven't didn't have planned out ahead of time exactly the order of how we would approach this or anything like that. So right now I might not remember the exact order, although I know here Paul, I'm sure you have it written down. So if I miss if I miss anything, 
Well, if I miss anything from uh, one day, you can like, oh, yeah, this is what we discussed first, if you like, if you don't have to. This is what we're talking about. Oh, that's fine. There's, yeah, we went through a lot. We don't expect everyone uh, offhand to remember everything, you know, because we went through a whole lot. But just first to start off, we went off uh, into the subject of justification by faith in a very Adventist context. What I mean by that is we looked at the message of 1888. And we looked at how we took the view justification. And in that, what we saw is that even justification itself has been greatly misunderstood. Lots of times in this looking into or investigation of justification by faith, the whole debate or the whole discussion is about faith or works. Faith or works. But in order to really correctly understand what is even being discussed in that faith or works, faith or works, we should understand what justification is. Because if we misunderstand justification, then what does it matter if it's by faith or by works, if we're pointing at the wrong thing? And so in our investigation of justification, we saw that what justification itself means is to be made righteous. To be made righteous. And to be uh, righteous, we saw, what did we find out as far as what righteousness is? Anyway. Righteousness? Okay, righteousness is sinlessness. sinlessness. Or righteousness is, as Ellen White would say, right doing, uh, obeying the law. Stephen? There's nothing else suffix. It's right doing by listening. Interesting. Okay, so Stephen's pointing out that the NES suffix is by wisdom. So righteousness is right doing by wisdom. And I haven't heard that before, but that just goes so perfectly in line with uh, everything that we've been finding. We found out that it's through wisdom that our works become acceptable. And so we're going to kind of recap on that, too. But um, what we saw, we went through a lot of statements from Jones and Wagner, which we can, we can find and I can send off to you all later. Perhaps today is a good day. We haven't really done this so far. But today might be a good day where we could have a piece of paper and anyone who wants, um, the, you know, to have email to them, we go to the phone for this week. Uh, we can have that sent and perhaps the easiest way we talked about it with Lorna before. She could send it out because she probably has all your emails already. And then also if anyone wants their names on the list of, uh, of well, my personal email list so I can send out invitations to you from week to week to come to our online meetings and also receive any emails that I might send out. So we'll probably have that, and then everyone will have the opportunity to put their name on whatever list you want, receive whatever information you want. And if any point someone wants to stop receiving emails or anything, just let us know and we'll take your name off the list. So, so we have this, this concept of justification by faith that we see in 1888, and we wanted to find out what justification is. And we were discussing it, and what we found is that how we have understood justification has been that it is a declaration by God that we are viewed as though we are righteous. Though we may continue in sin, but there's this work of sanctification to purify us from sin. That's how we've typically viewed it. So we, we were discussing that, and we discussed how actually, as far as justification is concerned, that's the exact same view that we see taught in Seventh-day Adventism at large, and even Sunday keeping Christianity. This, this concept of being declared as though we are righteous, even though we're not yet, though there is purifying to take place from that point. Now, in our investigation of that, what we saw is how is it that this 1880 message was rejected by the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And the 1880 message is called the message of righteousness by faith, justification by faith. And uh, out of all the terms that are used to identify that 1880 message, in Ellen White's writings, the term that's used probably more than any others is that it's a message of justification by faith. So how is it that if that 1888 message was rejected, and it was the message of justification by faith, how is it that we still teach the same thing about justification as do the nominal Seventh-day Adventists or Christians or the rest of it? In other words, if we say, oh, they have 
an incorrect teaching of justification by faith of the 1880 message, but yet we believe the same thing as them in regards to justification, how is it that we do not realize that we ourselves are also misunderstanding what that message is? So that's what we're looking at. And we looked at plenty of statements from Jones and Wagner to identify what justification itself is. And what we found is that justification is not merely a declaration by God that someone is as if they were righteous, but it is actually an act of creation whereby someone is transformed from being a sinner, someone who is, according to Christ, he sings as a child of Satan, a child of the devil, to being transformed into being sons and daughters of God, true having our sins actually taken away from us, not as a fiction, not as a theory, but as a practical reality. It's an act of creation whereby someone is, they have replaced, instead of their own righteousness, which is filthy rights, they have that taken away, and Christ's righteousness, Christ's life given to them. And Christ's life, surely, as you all know, is a sinless one. And this is what we saw in Romans chapter 5, how the life of Christ is given to us for justification. And then we went into Romans 6, and what I'd like to do after is we can go to Romans 6. Um, we went to Romans 6, and we saw it expand on this concept of justification as dying in Christ and being resurrected in Christ. So we just want to uh, read the whole chapter, perhaps, and um, I may or may not pause you <laughs> at any point here just to make a, a comment here or there. But the chapter, uh, if we take the scripture as it reads, it will be simple enough. So that's what we're going to do, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice that it's even so or in the same way as, or likewise to, and this is what Jones and Wagner like to emphasize, that even as Christ, after his death, rose into life with a victory over death, even so we raise out of this death of trespasses and sins into the newness of the life of Christ. And that is a sinless life with total victory over sin, just like Christ had total victory over death. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. Mm -hmm. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, mm -hmm. but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, 
For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Notice how that verse, this whole thing is paralleling the death and the resurrection of Christ with our experience of victory over sin. Notice back in verse 9, I've said, Death hath no more dominion over him. Speaking of Christ. When you get to verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Right? So we just I just wanted to uh, draw that connection and you can continue on. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Right. Go ahead. This is being made free from sin. That obviously means being free from sin, death, and God's law. Totally. I like it. Amen. So being free from sin is the same as being free from transgressing God's law. Because sin is transgression of the law. So, amen. Amen. Yes. I like to see mm-hmm. what we see from sin. We see from sin, I see what we see from and has no, the, the, the law has no condemnation to do Because I, I was made free from sin with you and taken all my guilt away. Mm-hmm. And so, so there's no condemnation. And it doesn't mean that we uh, base the pain in our purpose by Jesus. But I mean, I'm in church and I repeat that for those on here. Uh, what is going, being pointed out there, he's saying being free from sin doesn't mean that we are instantaneously made like Jesus, but that, um, you know, and he gave the example of, let's say you're in church there and some there's a woman there and for men in, in particular, a woman who has her, you know, cleavage showing or whatever and, you know, a man looks at that thinks of, you know, has a thought come across his mind puts it away, and then goes on. And basically the idea that uh, the brother was sharing is that we uh, no longer want to sin, no longer want to intentionally sin, but that we have this experience of uh, going on life and that it's understanding the love of God, sin does not have dominion over us anymore. So I just want to touch on a couple aspects there. Um, uh, Ellen White actually tells us that we are not to accept every thought as our own, right? Being free from sin does not mean we are free from temptation to sin, but it does mean that we will never give in to that temptation. Just like Christ. Christ was tempted in every way like as we are, right? So we there's this um, experience of, you know, we have... The law is very broad, as you're rightfully pointing out. We can sin in thought, word, or deed. And usually, well, you know, it's, it all comes back to the thought. It really does. It's a decision in the mind that is the seed of sin. 
Now, we have uh, what is often misunderstood, and this is what we've been looking at, is that when someone receives true justification, it has been commonly misunderstood that after that point, the person may still be giving temptation. But what we've been learning is that what this experience is of justification is a radical transformation of the person, whereby they actually do become as Christ because Christ lives in me, the hope of glory, right? And so we have, there's this experience of it's not I, but Christ. Now, I just want to touch on something briefly. This is why the 1880 message was rejected. Because what happened is, as people were hearing this message, as the general public men, the leaders, and so on, were hearing this message of 1888, particularly on the point of justification, what they realized and what was being told to them, what they had to come to terms with, and this is the message that each of us have to come to terms with, and in one sense it's hard, right? And in one sense, it's hopeless, as we see in Ezekiel 37, which we'll get to in a moment. But there is a hope which is outside of ourselves. Now, what it is, the message, is that we need to understand that if we are continuing on in sin, if we are transgressing the law, that we are not justified, that we have not yet been born again. And it's not, you know, we're told that Christ's righteousness is not a covering or cloak for sin, but that his righteousness is given to us when our sins are taken away. And that's not something that we can do ourselves. We can't take away our own sins. It's an act of creation that is accomplished on us and in us. It's a radical change in the person. So what, what these men had were faced with in 1888 is the thought of, wait a second, we've taught that we must obey the law, and we've taught that we're justified by faith, and then we go on keeping the law, and slowly through this process of sanctification, we become more and more obedient. Now, in 1888, what they were saying is, hey, wait a second. No, what that ends up being is this process of becoming obedient. It's an evolutionary mindset, whereby our recreation is not an instantaneous act of creation, but it's an evolution. And A.T. Jones had a wonderful sermon called, uh, I believe it's called Creationist or Evolutionist, yes. which. And it's this subject, okay, are we a creationist or are we an evolutionist? Do we believe that we are created by an act of creation by God? Or is it that we slowly, through this process, become more and more obedient? That's, that's how we typically are used to viewing it. However, in 1888, what they were faced with is, look, we need to understand the power of God and the power of forgiveness. We even found out that forgiveness itself is not just the mere declaration by God that I will no longer hold your sins against you, but that forgiveness is actually that act of creation. It's a change in the man, not a change in God. A.T. Jones pointed out well that to imply that God, in forgiving us, is changing his view towards us and saying, I'm no longer going to hold your sins against you, is to imply that he was holding our sins against us. And he was saying, that's wrong. That's a wrong view of God. Our God is so loving that it's, it's, he's pleading with us to simply pay attention and to listen and to get to know him. And so within that, we, it's understanding that, you know, although there is a hard aspect to deal with, in understanding justification by faith. In that, we have to be faced with our own spiritual death, the lack of spiritual life, as represented in the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. We also have to understand that, you know, the bones, in fact, they cry out, our hope is lost. You know, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we are cut off or utterly cut off. So they recognized that they had no spiritual life. But what was necessary is that the spirit had to come from the four winds and breathe life into these bones. And that is the experience of justification. Receiving the life of Christ ministered unto us by the spirit. And receiving that life of Christ, like it says here as we've been reading Romans 6, just as when Christ rose, death had no more dominion over him, just so when we, when we rise in Christ, 
sin has no more dominion over us. Ooh. It says that we should no more serve sin, right? Romans 6, 6, mm-hmm. henceforth, we should no more serve sin. Now, lots of times what we do is we don't really recognize the standard because of fear of tomorrow. We think, if I accept this, if I ask God to justify me now, what about tomorrow when the temptation comes? Is it really going to happen that I'm not going to sin again? You know, if it's by faith, that, and the wonderful answer is yes. That is the truth. Now, one more aspect, and then I see I see your hand there. Um, when we when we look at this subject, justification by faith, lots of times we think that we're still justified if we continue in sin, if it's just a little bit or just occasionally. But we have to understand that if we transgress on one point, we transgress on all points, right? If we are a liar, if we lie, we're also a murderer, right? Once we're guilty under the law, we're guilty under the law. When we are under no condemnation, it's a reality that we have no guilt. It's a reality that we have no condemnation because it's to them who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, Mm -hmm. right? So those who are no longer under the dominion of the carnal mind, the carnal mind is the mind which minds the thing of the flesh, which is operated according to the flesh. But if we are operated according to the spirit, if we mind the things of the spirit, we cannot give into the flesh. We will not give into the flesh. And that's the mind of Christ. Go ahead. Yes. The most important thing is the mind of Mm-hmm. And then he said, if no one gives you the number, I know the danger of others. Mm-hmm. And that's the power that you have. When you have no foundation, then you have power to overcome sin. Right. But the Lord, you feel, uh, I don't know what to do. Oh, I feel. I shouldn't have eaten this because. I feel sick. Uh, I shouldn't be hungry. I feel sick. So we are literally on false and unknown combination of our own works. Mm-hmm. But if we see the completeness that we get paid at all, right. now I'm free to serve him. Beautiful. So now I'm not on the law, mm-hmm. I'm on the grace. And then, uh, taking this law is becomes easier. I'm more I satisfied with him and his love. Mm-hmm. I'm th- thank you for pointing that out. Were you just pointing? I just want to quickly repeat this for those. Yeah, I know. Here. Um, but this should be answered. Okay. Also, sure. back to the question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. And for David, he also right. said, go and, and I, I don't name go and no more. Right. Right. Exactly. So what he's pointed out, he pointed out the, the idea of the woman caught in adultery and this story of how she needed to be freed from condemnation in order that she may go and sin no more. That's so important to understand because we have to understand the necessity for this transformation in order to be sin-free. In other words, we can't do something to build ourselves up to this transformation and build ourselves up to this lack of condemnation. We must receive the gift of the righteousness of Christ, again, in reality, not just as a theory, And that enables us to go and sin no more. Why? Because our sins and the carnal mind have been destroyed. That's what it says in Ephesians 2, how he abolished the enemy, right? That caused the separating wall that separates us from God. And abolishing that carnal mind, then we can go on and live sin-free, just like Christ lived when he was here walking among us. And just like he lives today. <laughs> so, again, we want to understand this as a reality. That's what we want to emphasize. This whole idea of justification as being made sinless. We want to emphasize it as reality, not just as a theory of something that we think that we're not sinning, but then we keep on living and we come to something and we give into a temptation and we do something according to the flesh. When, when that happens, that should indicate to us that we are in that same place as Nicodemus, in which Christ said, you must be born again, born of the Spirit, right? So 
this kind of leads us into where we've been going. In studying justification, we've seen, okay, justified, is a, justification is the same as being born again. And being born again is being born of the Spirit. We went and we saw that the resurrection of the dry bones, that valley of dry bones that was dead in trespasses and sins, is that same experience of justification. And we saw that that also is said to be by the Spirit. First, Ezekiel prophesies to the bones. And what happens to the bones? There's this great noise and a shaking and bone comes together with bone and there's laid upon them sinews and flesh and skin. And then they're laying there, these lifeless, reformed bodies. And that's what happens to a lot of us, you know, in, in the Adventist church and so on, where we get reformed, no, no more drinking coffee, no more eating meat, no more doing this, no more doing that, right? But then we're proud. We have pride or we have, you know, all these different things, envy or whatever it may be. And those are these reformed, lifeless bodies. There's a need to receive the life from the Spirit. So Ezekiel is told to prophesy again. And he prophesies this time not to the bones, but he prophesies to the Spirit to come from the four winds and breathe life into these bones. And then what happens? The bones rise as a great army and they march forward into the land of promise. Right? Yeah. So this is the message that we've been seeing. We've been seeing that justification by faith is that resurrection. It is being born again. It is the establishment of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. So in this, we've been looking at the kingdom. We've been looking at justification. We've been looking at the spirit. If, if we're going to receive that resurrection, we need to receive it from the spirit. Now, we need to understand who this spirit is because in the portrayal of the Spirit giving us life in the experience of justification, the Spirit is always portrayed as being close at hand, right? The Spirit is portrayed in Ezekiel 37 as breathing breath into us. We know that when Adam was created on the sixth day, that God breathed into his nostrils. That wasn't something done from afar, that was done up close and personal. In being born again, how much closer of a symbol could we have? Being in the womb of the Spirit and birth, right? That is a very close experience with the Spirit. So we need to understand who this Spirit is, because we need to know this Spirit personally, right? So this has been our subject, and we've, we've looked at this issue of the Godhead, right? And we... There's, again, so many different ideas of okay, what is God and life, and we've considered uh, different things to understand who the Spirit is in order to get to know who the Spirit is. Now, one of the things that we are looking at is this idea of mankind, man and woman, being made in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says that we were made in the image of God, male and female. It says, God said, let us make mankind in our image. It doesn't say, let me make mankind in my image. You see, there's this plurality, and within that plurality, the image that is made is male and female. And uh, Michael's favorite passage, Romans chapter 1, uh, talks about, Paul there is talking about this issue of homosexuality. And he says that there's no excuse for homosexuality, whether it's men with men or women with women. And he gives a reason for why there is no excuse. And the reason that he gives is found in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1. And it says, For the invisible things of him, referring to God, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Go ahead. Um, it's interesting, actually, prior before that, before the world of birth, right. uh, 15. Yeah, 16. Uh, 16 yeah. Right? And what it does, um, he says, so much as immediately I know the truth of gospel to them on the rainbows, and he says, oh, I have 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Right. Right. And we had spoken when we talked about the anointed. Mm-hmm. So I'm not afraid to speak the gospel of the anointed one. Yeah. Right. And we know right. who anointed. For it is the power of God on the salvation. salvation. So the only way to receive the salvation is to receive the gospel of the anointed one. And then if you go down, it starts, it's more or less, start doing it 17, for there it is the righteousness, the right doing of God, and it is the right doing of, um, mm-hmm. by wisdom, mm-hmm. right, revealed from face to face, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, which is what justification is talking about, the justification by faith. And it goes down, and then as it's doing it, the interesting part, mm-hmm. when to pass verse 20, mm-hmm. And he goes on and on. All of a sudden, he jumps into homosexuality. Right. So I'm just going to repeat that for those online. Michael was pointing out, when you go earlier in the chapter, to verse starting verse 16, it's talking about the gospel of Christ. And we'll get into the subject of the anointed one, and in, in particular, as we see in Zechariah 4, the anointed ones. And what's that about? And he says, for therein, in this gospel of Christ, Therein is the righteousness, right given by wisdom, of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he's talking about justification and the gospel and the Godhead. And then it gets into this thing of homosexuality. So Michael was pointing out, you know, what is the connection then? And that's, that's what we're discussing. We find out that the reason that Paul gives for why homosexuality is wrong is found in verse 20, that the even the invisible things of God, even the eternal power and Godhead, can be clearly seen and understood by the things that were made in the creation. Mm-hmm. So we go and see the creation. And, nobody has an excuse. and no one has an excuse for homosexuality. <laughs> because of what can be revealed about the Godhead, by the things that were made in creation. So when we go to the creation story, as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, we have something that was given to show us of the Godhead. And that, of course, was mankind. Mankind, and this I won't go into all the aspects, there's more than just this, but mankind was a thing which was specifically made to be in the image of the Godhead. And it says, Male and female, maybe them. So, and it says, God said, let us make mankind in image, male and female. <laughs> so, let me see that the image of God in the Godhead, there is both male and female. And we see that the human family and the marital relationship is founded on the truth of the image of God. Now we can see why there's no excuse. For homosexuality, because this was, yeah, if if there was, if the Godhead, for example, was all male, and our marital relationships, our family was based off the image of God, as Genesis so clearly says, then there would surely be excuse for homosexuality, or if the God was all female. But seeing that it is male and female, we are left without excuse. Now, this this is something that we're looking at. Uh, to some degree throughout this week, and we saw this concept of the image of God and this sort of plurality that's there in the Godhead, and that it's plurality not only as to number, but also as to gender. And this we saw revealed even in the most common word for God that we find in Hebrew Bible. There's many different words or different variations, I should say, of a word that are translated God. Uh, the word that is most commonly translated God is the word Elohim. Now, I'm just going to briefly explain a little bit of the variations of that term. The word Elohim is from uh, the parent root El. The word El is just the singular masculine form for the word God, or mighty one. Now, the word El in, in Hebrew, and this, you know, Tim or Stephen, or people who have looked into Hebrew will be able to tell you this, and I have two articles on the back which go into a little bit more detail explaining what I'm about to explain. There's a suffix in. It's two letters, yod, men. And that's the masculine plural suffix. 
So if you take L, the word L, and put that em at the end, you have Eli, which is the word for God's plural. And it's something that we see in the Hebrew Bible uh, many times and mostly referring to gods of the nations, right? The wicked gods and so on, which is another subject that we'll try to wrap into this today. Um, so we have this word Elin, and but that's not the only variation of the word El. There's also another form, Ella or Eloa, and that A ending is the feminine ending in Hebrew. It's a word that means goddess. Now, in, if you open up your King James Bible or any Bible, this word is accurately translated as goddess in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 5. It talks about the goddess Asherah, and it's Ella, and it's Aleph, Lamed, He, and it has a little Yoda at the end, so it's Zesu, the goddess of the Zidonians. So, yeah, we're here because it's the Strong's numbers. They just put the basic form. And uh, this is First Kings 11.5. They accurately translate it, the goddess of the Zidonians. Just a few verses later, you go to verse 9, verse 9, and it says, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord. Then it's Allah with the Yod, the exact same form, the exact same four letters, Aleph, Mamet, A, Yod. The goddess of Israel is the exact same form. So that's one form. It's the feminine form, Allah or Elohah. So this is something that I know it may be new to people, but what we're going to do is just ask people to prayerfully investigate before coming to any conclusions, right? We don't want to simply jump on one side or the other in saying, oh, you know, this is false because it's feminine, or saying, okay, this is true without checking it out. I ask them, go, you can go get a uh, Hebrew scriptures. You want to find something that's a little bit more than Strong's Concordance, just because Strong's gives you only the base word. It doesn't give you the actual word that's there, just the root or the base. And so from that, you know, I invite everyone to go ahead and investigate this. And so you see the feminine form, Ella or Ella Go ahead. Sure. Right. Mm. Right. Right. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful. And we'll, we will get to that within the discussion. So the, the question is, you know, we need to see in the scriptures the same conclusion of the female Holy Spirit. And we need to understand this in light of the judgment. You understand when the judgment opened, we have the Father and the Son. So where's this Holy Spirit? And particularly, where's this feminine Holy Spirit, this female Holy Spirit. So we will certainly get to that. And last night we had a little bit more of a lengthy discussion uh, which dealt directly with that topic, with the cleansing of the sanctuary and so on. So we'll get to that a little bit later as we go on in our summary in this particular meeting. So we have just this concept, but to continue on with the various forms of the word El or Elohim, uh, we have this other form, Elohot, it's the form Ella with the oat ending, which is the feminine plural. And that's used, it's the Hebrew word for goddesses. It does not show up within the scriptures as we have it today. However, it is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's quoted in one of the articles on the back called Plural God Language in Hebrew Bible with references for you to go and check it out further. Then we have this other form, Elohim. Now, Elohim is a very common word in the Bible. It occurs many, many times. But it is a very rare form of a word. In other words, the word itself is masculine and feminine and plural. It has the feminine base, Ella, which is Aleph, Mom, and Hey, and sometimes it's Ella, which is just a slightly different spelling as the feminine form base, but with the masculine plural ending. So the word Elohim itself talks about God or mighty one, in particular, because it's plural, mighty ones, 
But it's not only plural in regards to number, it's also plural in regards to gender. Feminine, masculine, plural. Now when we understand that, when we read Genesis 1, it can make sense to us. Because it says, Elohim said, let us make mankind in our image, male and female. Right? So when you understand that the word itself indicates plural, male and female, we can understand why the image of that Elohim was plural, male and female. Okay? So, again, the articles in the back uh, go through that in more detail, but we wanted to give a summary of that, what we found out about, about the word Elohim. Can you give an explanation of the image and the art image? Sure. And all the right and the sure. definition of self. Right. The image and the definition of art. Sure. Now, this, there's an article that will be written about that sometime soon, but what we can find is that that image and likeness, both of the Hebrew words that give us image and likeness, I believe it's a, is it Samek and Demut are the two Hebrew words, and they both portray a physical image or representation and a physical likeness. Now, this can be seen also within Genesis when it talks about uh, Adam begetting his children in his image and likeness, right? They were physically made patterned after him. And also in uh, Genesis 9, after male and female, after male and female, amen. And, and Adam, the fact that even the term image is a mirror, when you right. a mirror, and most of us go, man, he, he looks like the split image of his father, right. right? Or he says, he's just like his father, and likeness denotes more character, right. while image right. denotes more resemblance, in the sense of, and you can fall both ways, but in the way we use it today. Right, and the way people are used to using it, we have image and likeness, more of a spin image, like Michael was pointing out, being a spin image, and being also as the same character and so on. Now, in Hebrew, both portrays a physical understanding, but we understand that Ellen White points out we are made in the image of God, not only as to our character, so it is in regards to character, but also in regards to our outward form and physical features. So we gave the references for that earlier in the week. I'll mention one right now, just in case people want to write it down and check it out. Um, one reference for that is the book Education, uh, pages 15 and 20. Book Education, pages 15 and 20. And there are other references in which she speaks of the same thing. Now, in Genesis 9, verse 6, we're also told, it says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of Elohim, the image of God, made he him. So notice that there is this punishment to come against those who shed man's blood and having their blood shed. And the reason given for that is because we're made in the image of God. So you see that by damaging the physical body, there is a punishment of the physical body being damaged because of a damage of the representation of, yeah, the defacing of the image of God. So we see that there is this physical image going on. Stephen? Um, I ran across this question. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of people, I don't know how many of you have ever watched this program, the movie Star Trek, and there's this nebulous colored blob of space, and it's somehow sentient, conscious, and, and powerful, and right. And I can't tell you how many people I've come across to say that that's the way God is. Right. Okay? And so, um, a little bit out of anger, I responded, and I, in my manuscript, I have, I'm just going to take it some time. Sure, sure. I made two um, columns. One yeah. where the Elohim says, I have an ear. Right. And the other where the column where the prophet says, Elohim has an ear. Right. Okay? And... Uh, I go down, he's got a, he's got a brow upon which he says he's got a crown. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and I worked my way all the way down to the feet. Exactly. Where, where, where he says he has all these body parts. Mm -hmm. And then in a separate place, I go through where the scriptures talk about the female body parts. Right. Okay, so mm -hmm. I thank you so much for reference to that. Stephen here is pointing out that, you know, people are familiar with different things like Star Trek, and then I guess in one episode or whatever it may be, in a number, I'm not sure. There's this kind of ethereal blob in space, this consciousness that's there, and many people today have this, this concept that that is what God is like. It is called immaterialism or incorporealism, and this is a concept that many have. And uh, Ellen White talked about this uh, as being pantheistic, and uh, we won't go into all the history of that and the Kellogg and so on, but. It is what many people believe today. It's the concept that I was raised with. And many people believe that God is, you know, have this concept of God being beyond space and time. Yeah, beyond form, no form, formless God. And what Stephen was pointing out is he has this manuscript about this concept of our heavenly family. And in one place in his manuscript, he goes through and shows places of the prophets, identifying God as having body parts, and then God himself identifying himself with body parts. And then he has another column showing God identifying himself with female body parts. Now, I just want to mention, this is something that the ancient Hebrews understood. Within their context, within their consciousness, within their thought process about God, anciently they conceived of the heavenly family, the Godhead, to be physical. There is a set of texts from the early centuries called Shior Koma, which in Hebrew means measurement of divine body. And in these texts, it is literally delineating in detail the precise measurements of the body parts of the members of the God. Now, I'm not saying that that's an inspired text or that. Those are accurate measurements, but what I am saying is that when we consider that, it's very clear that the ancient Hebrews conceived of the members of the Godhead to be physical, physical and also with both genders. So I referenced uh, some of the texts and quote from that little bit, and again, by the article from back under the title "Plural God Language in Hebrew Bible." So just make sure to read the footnotes, and then you'll see references to that. Now, we have these concepts, and it's kind of like, okay, what's, what exactly is going on here? We have this plurality, we have this gender issue. Further into our discussion of plurality, we looked at another kind of section of this plurality discussion, and that's this idea of multiple Yahwehs. The word Yahweh is the Hebrew word or the Hebrew name for the God of Israel. Now, there are a number of places where we see multiple Yahwehs. Would you mind going to Genesis 19.4? This is uh, an easy verse to remember. There's many verses like this to show this plurality. We already saw that the word Elohim is plural. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, that's the first occurrence of the word Yahweh. And it says Yahweh Elohim. Or Deuteronomy 6.4 says Yahweh Elohim which is Yahweh, our Elohim, or Yahweh, our God. Now, here we have this concept of, we have the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Usually, not always, uh, it's not 100% consistent, but that is mostly parallel to the Hebrew word for Yahweh, when you see this in the King James or other translations. So notice here, Genesis 19.24. And, and I'm going to use the word Yahweh here just to distinguish what we're looking at, because we need to know what the text actually says. We need to be able to identify numbers. So notice here, then Yahweh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Doesn't that read just a little bit odd? You know, doesn't it, wouldn't it be more natural with our way of thinking of things to have it read then Yahweh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire out of heaven. 
that's how we, you know, typically kind of think of it. But there's this kind of something going on here that's just a little bit odd, right? Yahweh rained down upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Now, we're not going to go into all the details of this now. We went through it during the week, and um, we can, uh, I can send out information concerning this uh, to all, if they like, or anyone who would like uh, later. <laughs> okay, let's just cover Genesis 18. Let's just cover, and I think it's important, and uh, we'll, we'll do this. Um, I don't know, Tim, if, because we have the different files, there was, there was the, uh, they were probably on the computer, I don't know where they are. Yes. It's probably just in your email. Would you be able to pull that up? Yeah, that'd be great. So what we're going to do now, and this is important for our discussion, it's a good recap for those who were here. And it's also good for those who are not. Now, we we may try to go through it faster since we're trying to recap a whole week of four hours a day of discussion. Um, we may go through this faster than we did the first time, but we're going to try to go through it in such a way that it's easily understandable and uh, discernible to all here. So this Genesis 19.24 is one instance. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. That's... Right. another gospel, or he that preaches another gospel, let him be a curse, right? So this is something that's very important, right? It is, we can't, I, I don't want to skip over, gloss over the importance of that. This is vital in regards to the truth or the error of what we are saying here today, right? Is this the gospel, or is this another gospel which is not a gospel, not good news, right? So what we are here to proclaim, and this is something that needs to be tested, we are not here to say, this is what it is, believe it. We are here to say, we believe wholeheartedly that this is the gospel. And we are going to present to you the evidence for it, and you can all take it and investigate it. And we ask you to take it to the law and the testimony, as Isaiah said, and we ask you to take it to the law and to the testimony with much Prayer. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says that um, we, we need to understand things, but we can't understand things by depending upon the spirit of men. What man knows the things of man, save the spirit of man knows him. And what man knows the things of God, save the spirit of God. So what we need to do, we want to ask people to investigate this, take the law and the testimony. And in doing this, we ask people to take it prayerfully, being guided by the Spirit. We need to seek wisdom in this. So, in um, <clears throat> short answer to your question, and then we're going to take a quick break and come back and try to continue in this and pick up a pace and uh, be able to go through here. So, what relevance is this to our salvation? Now, in the scriptures, we, we might ask, and you can ask any Christian, is it relevant to salvation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? 
And people will say, yes, right? That is so relevant. Now, what is Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, have to do with salvation? Right? We need to understand that our Father, which are in heaven, had a begotten Son through whom we are saved. Right? We need to understand that He came to die on our behalf, to live on our behalf, and to intercede for us in the heavenly sanctuary. And in doing this, He does not do it in vain. He doesn't do it for no purpose. The purpose of it is to bring us salvation. And the Hebrews talks about how he became our great high priest in a sanctuary not built with hands, but made in the heavens. And in this, he ministers not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood. Right. So Christ, as our intercessor, is our Savior. Right. This is what we've learned. Elmite in Great Controversy says that the investigative judgment is the subject upon which our minds are to constantly dwell. That's Christ interceding on our behalf. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps or helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit in here in, in Greek and in translation from the Greek, it's neuter gender, at least in this translation. It says the Spirit itself intercedes or maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Just want to point out in Hebrew and Aramaic, it says herself. Okay? And we'll get to that a little bit more after the break. But the Spirit herself intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. A few verses down, verse 34, says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? The scriptures and the, ceremon the ceremonial system, the sacrificial service, shows that we have two intercessors, the Spirit and Christ. If Christ being the Son of God is relevant for our salvation as his intercession or as him being our intercessor, surely the Spirit being our intercessor, it is relevant for salvation to know the Spirit's relation in the Godhead, in the God family. What we can see is that Christ as our intercessor is represented in the sacrificial service. Right? We talk about, behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Stephen, last night, did a very excellent job of showing us how there are many places where it is required, according to the law, to bring a feminine sacrifice, in particular, for sin offering. So the question is, if Christ as our intercessor is represented as uh, different animals in the sacrificial service, could not the Spirit, as our intercessor, be represented in the sacrificial service? The sacrificial service has all this detail. It must be for a purpose. And he well emphasized that for these sacrifices, which demanded a female sacrifice, if we took a male, we would be in disobedience. What's that about? He also pointed out very, very clearly how the sacrifice of the red heifer, which is a female sacrifice, that the sacrifice of the red heifer is 100% necessary in order for anything in the sanctuary to happen, in order for the priest to become priests, in order to go and worship in the sanctuary, in order for the temple to be ordained or anointed, you have to have the ashes of the red heifer. In order for the sanctuary to be cleansed, Adventist terminology, you have to have the sacrifice of the red heifer. Mm -hmm. So the female sacrifices are vital. Ellen White talks about the sacrificial service being the gospel in type. Right? So this gospel of justification by faith, justification by faith is being born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We're born of a woman. This is why Nicodemus said, Am I to enter back into my mother's mm -hmm. womb? Right? So we see all this feminine terminology. Go ahead. Yeah. 
I'm going to start with the first question. Sure. That's the yeah. major parallel uh, in the Right. Uh, about the Bible. When he said, Yes. 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 Uh, 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 okay, that's that's it. So I'll try to briefly address those and I'll repeat it here for those who are meeting with us online. There's two questions. One is when it says that God made mankind in his image, male and female, we have this issue of first it was just the male, it was just Adam and that. So what, what's that all about? Then the second question is, how does this concept of the Holy Spirit and the femininity of the Holy Spirit relate to the unpardonable sin, if you sin against the Spirit? Okay, so the first question is a good question. I want to quickly just mention one thing that is commonly, commonly missed. Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. Um, it says here, I'll wait till you get there. Genesis chapter 5, verse 2 says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. All right, called their name Adam in the day when they were created. No, okay. yeah, Adam is Adam in uh, Hebrew, the word Adama is the word for earth. Yes, that's right. It means red soil. Amen. And Adama, that's red soil, earth. And Adam is the one who comes from the earth. You know, it's the earthling, basically human is the word that we use today. Right? But they were both called Adam. Right? Now, here we have this, this situation where Eve, she didn't receive the name Eve, you can read this in Genesis 3, until Adam gave it to her after the fall. Right? So, why is it that there was first just Adam, the man? Now, surely, God knew that he'd also make the woman, right? And later in the scriptures, we learned that they were both made on that same day. However, the male, Adam, was made first. So, why is this? Notice how throughout the creation, we keep saying, you know, God on the first day made all these things, and he said that it was good. It was said that it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And it was all male and female, whether it's plants, whether it's fish, whether it's animals, whatever it may be. It was all male, female, it was all good. And then he made the male, which was shown, according to Paul in Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 20, this whole story is to show us the Godhead. So what we see is that first he was made alone. But what did God say? It is not good that man should be alone. Lots of times when we hear the story, we think that Adam was walking around in the garden, and he said, hey, God, where's my mate? This isn't good. <laughs> it's not good that I should be alone. But really, it was God, which shows that God, he wasn't in need of being told of this lack that was there. He was, he did this on purpose, right? He did this on purpose for a reason, to teach us a lesson. And what it pictures for us is the story of God himself, right? What we see is that we're told that God is love. And if God is love, God must be ever-growing. Love is ever-growing. And it must be expressed. And so, just as with Adam, at some point, it was a good thing for the woman to be brought forth of his own substance of himself, for him to share that love with, just so with God, it was a good thing for him to bring forth from himself the female, as we know as the Holy Spirit. Um, so basically, we have this concept of a sword being told and Adam being this image of God. And so we see the woman coming forth from his side, just so with God, or we're seeing the formation of our heavenly family. What they were told when Eve was brought forth 
was to bring forth and multiply, right? So we see the story of Christ being the begotten Son of God, right? So this, again, is something that the Adventists understood, Christ to be the begotten Son of God. The early Adventists, I recommend that every person here goes and looks up their literature in regards to Christ, how Christ was not a created being, how Christ was not a, uh, Christ indeed was God, but that Christ was God, according to Hebrews chapter 1, by inheritance. He was made of the very substance of God, and by inheritance received a better name than the name of Hebrews chapter 1. So Christ is the begotten Son of God. So I think we'll probably actually take a break now before we come back with the, the second question of the unpardonable sin and Teresa's comment and a couple of people here I think to say too.